Greetings, programmers. Sorry we got a late start today, but we're going now. Um, it's all about REST services, multi-tier API design, load balancers, and edge proxies, which is a mouthful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I may I should add to the warranty disclaimer that we may start either early or late. Because I think last week we started a little early, but the casual conversation, uh, programmers getting together, talking about topics we're interested in, and hopefully you're interested in talking about as well. Upcoming tea, coffee, and code sessions. We have the unit testing, integration testing, 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 and more testing. And uh, code profiling optimization, which is really kind of more testing. So, yeah, be sure you join us for those. Those will be great ones as well. And on the call with me today, we have Holger Flick, Dr. Holger Flick, CEO of Flix Engineering and Evangelist for TMS Software. Thanks for joining us, Holger. Yeah, thanks for the invite, Jim. Always great to be yeah. here. Just chatting for two hours about Delphi is always a great topic. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. And Wagner, there he is. Uh, TMS Software Business Product Manager for Aurelius XData Remote DB. And also, you can find him on landgraph.dev, where he has training courses and his Delphi blog. How are you doing, Hi, Wagner? Hi, guys. Hey, How hey. Good, good. Where did you take and that of code, course, Wagner? Germany? What's up? Where, where did you take that photo, Wagner? Because there's German lettering in the background, and you're not from Germany. That's why, you know, it's, 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 those pictures are from Germany, right? Yes, it's Dusseldorf. Ah, see, ah! Look at that, <laughs> my <Okay>. home base. <laughs> but so Wagner, you're actually in uh, Brazil, right? Yes, I am. Yeah. Okay. It's I cold didn't. Here. Oh, that's true. Heck, I should come down and visit then, because it's too hot here. <laughs> <laughs> too hot and rainy. Yeah. And unfortunately, I don't have a slide for Ian today. I'll have to, um, Ian's that guy there, wherever he's at. Uh, no, MVP. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and uh, Poet. Uh, what else? Um, loves programming in Delphi, lives in Texas, you know, that guy. Narrator, voice actor, all those kind of things. Uh, although voice. I don't do a lot of that at the moment. Uh, yes, yes. It's the posh way of saying I talk for a living and get people pay me. <laughs> <laughs> and, put on, and put on stupid voices. This is my stupid voice I have all the time. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So grab your beverage and uh, let's have a conversation. Check it here. Well, let's start out with, oh, what did I hit? That's all right. Um, so we had a um, a webinar last week. We had Danny Wynn did a series of webinars on getting started with REST services, on uh, building REST clients and connecting to REST servers and such. So if there are any questions about uh, these topics, go to put them in the question panel. And we will uh, discuss those. But then I have a few slides as well, some different topics we can go through for this too. Expand that. So REST is representational state transfer. It's a so it's interesting. It, REST is not a protocol. It is a description of how the pro, how a uh, how communication happens. It's an interesting differentiation, I think. 
but it's a it's based on the fundamentals of HTTP, and it is uses the same verbs that HTTP uses for your web browser uses when you connect to a website, and it's just a way to transfer data back and forth. So Delphi includes libraries, the REST client and the REST server for client, or includes libraries for both building clients and servers. Um, yeah. Yeah, many, many but, people think that REST is a standard, but it is, it's not a standard, it's just a, an architecture. Yes. Yeah, exactly. It, and so it makes it weird because, so we used to use SOAP way back in the day, and it was a standard, but it was too heavyweight. So now we use REST, which isn't a standard, but isn't heavyweight. Yeah, I'm, not, with, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I'd even call it a uh, architecture either. It's more a case of uh, an agreed set of things that happen. I, I think it's a little bit more loose than an architecture. Architecture implies that everyone knows what's going to happen when you do something with REST. I think the only the only real basic um, uh, kind of agreed standards are that you know REST quite often returns JSON and stuff like that but um soap was much more rigid really wasn't it i mean it had all sorts of standards attached to what should happen when you had a soap server yeah even that but you you also find rest servers with xml or priority formatting like um i usually also return binary base 64 encoded data through rest interface but um there was an interesting point i recently read on twitter that got me thinking um, from Hadi Hariri, some people still might know him. He was, um, yes. he's, he's in the, was a big member in the Delphi community, Intraweb and Indie, and he's with JetBrains now, still doing amazing work there. And uh, he posted, um, he's he's always very sarcastic, and and uh, so he said like, I bet you a beer that uh, all of the that 99% of the uh, Web APIs that call themselves REST are actually HTTP web APIs and not REST, and that is that is the deciding thing. Like REST has certain principles that Wagner knows probably better than anybody of us that have to be implemented how to communicate using HTTP. And I myself usually take shortcuts and never implement a full REST implementation. Um, as it should be, because, um, for example, the one thing you see all the time, uh, not to go to, into too much detail, but like Delphi developers always like to have like a method, like if something is available, check if something is available, I have a method for that, and then I actually get the resource that I want. And the REST principle states, you get the resource and then the status code of your HTTP request actually tells you what's going on. If it's four or three, you're not authorized. If it's four or four, you're trying to request something that isn't there. So you do not actually need to ask, is something there or not? You simply just use the uh, um, status codes of the HTTP request. And that is the difference between building an HTTP web API and a REST interface. You know, which you get, for example, if you use um, Xdata, you get like REST. I'd never really thought about that before. That's interesting. Yeah, but it's think about it. It's, it's actually true. I, I I was just as stunned as you are right now, probably. But if you think about it, you never really strictly, as long as you didn't use a tool, for example, that converts a database table into like for example red server i don't just want to mention x data like red server same thing if you publicize a table a data table from a database it creates so many things but it doesn't create is the table there is the record there it it literally implements a get a put a delete and if you try to delete something that isn't there you get the status code 404 if you try to delete something and you're not authorized you get a for one or four or three, that's always where I struggle, Wagner. <laughs> you know, it's that kind of stuff. <laughs> huh. 
So now I'm now I'm think rethinking all the stuff I've done with REST. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Because REST literally is only a word that it's stateless. That's something we haven't mentioned so far. Um, because like, if you work with um, tools back in the day, and especially if you have a Delphi VCL application, you have a state of your application. And with REST, you don't. So uh, right. you literally don't know, and that, that's what, it, it's, a, it's a blessing and it's a curse at the same time. So you have to implement everything in a way that you have to be independent of something. Oh, this is the first call, or is this the second call, or this is the third? Everything has to be stateless, um, and that's also something that is very important to realize. Which is different with connected APIs because REST. Um, some people might not um, make the implication right away when they hear HTTP is of course connectionless, which is also a big difference to other. Um, technologies that uh, Delphi has to offer in the multi-tier because there's also mu uh, also connected offerings and REST is also not only stateless, but also connectionless. Um, yeah, so now, I, I always wondered about the whole stateless thing with REST because how does that play into, so I guess having a uh, authorization login credentials doesn't violate being stateless, does it? No, but you you have to implement the um, methods to get something that is protected. Doesn't have to depend on the other method. It has to work even if you do not call the other method. And uh, there are several ways to do that. And tokens are usually is, is the big topic what is being used right now that you put a topic in a, a, a token into the request that actually requests the information from the web server. Hello. So, and uh, hi. And hi. The, the, the token hi. the token identifies the um, user, and that is something you have to build on the back end yourself, or you have to use a uh, framework that provides the whole um, multi-tenancy for you. But otherwise you have to implement it all by yourself. And that is something um, that you get with a uh, state-driven framework right right away because you log in, you're logged in, you have the status of being logged in and this status doesn't exist in the REST server. Yeah, you see, I think that when you say REST has no state, uh, that, 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 that in itself is kind of underlines the fact that there's no agreed protocol there because there's a state that happens behind the scenes, isn't there? And like you say, when you're authenticating, that in itself, you could argue, well, authenticating against a REST server, it happens, which then creates a state of, oh, you're an authenticated connection. But as you've said before, that that happen, that can happen every time. You can pass JWT things and stuff like that in there. Uh, we we have a REST server that very much has a state because it has to have a state of you are authenticated, and there is a, uh, a kind of uh, level of preparedness in what has to happen in order for the okay. rest to be yeah. meaningful so you yeah. know it's a, and, I, and i think that you know if you said for example give me all the employees uh and it kind of returns a big you know object that's got a bunch of employees in or some randomness like that if it, if you're talking say a multi-company scenario which is what we are doing um you've also got to say and for this company and then you also just have to say and for this particular logged in user and also for this particular um cloud server or whatever it is so um whilst rest is is a a, a non-state state a non-state state i think, I, think yeah. I have a pretty pretty good a, example pretty good example like if you log in into one of those non-rest servers you you log yourself in and then each follow-up <laughs> client client request knows that this user that is requesting something is authenticated and authorized for certain things but with rest 
the client each time another request comes has to pass in the token over and over and over again that's just the difference and thanks for the explanation that's actually a pretty good one of course if you think of amazon for example when they have their product card they keep a state of your shopping session on their back end but as you know you can switch between different devices and still you keep your shopping card you know and that's because they keep it on the back end and not you on as on the client yeah and i, and I think the uh, the um someone was commenting on one of the news groups oh well done for correcting the whole uh what did they say stateless nonsense which is a little bit harsh i think but what you know I think I think that is a bit harsh because everything you do is context. Everything you know, like you you know, even the concept of making connection in the first place in order to make REST requests has got a state where you've established a connection. You know, I mean, what what do you call state? It's, it's just it's a meaningless term, really. I, you know, I think the, I agree with you. Everything has a state at some point, but I think yeah. that the point is that your one request doesn't doesn't have to depend on a previous request like hoger said uh I, this request will will work if i have performed a request before that i have authenticated that is a state so like every every request has to be uh, self-contained so to speak and one one way for you to think that the server is stateless enough is if you can uh scale it so for example what happens if you have a server and you launch 10 servers at the same time will the client be able to will your application work if the client connects to any of those clients or does it have to connect to a specific client that you have connected before so yeah. if you can launch 10 or 20 servers and any server can answer the clients correctly then you are uh, uh, stateless enough, so to speak. Yeah, the guy. Yeah, so makes, either. The, sorry, the guy that mentioned. That's a good one. <laughs> the guy, the guy that mentioned that on the, on the forum is now backpedaling very quickly and apologising in case we all kill him. <laughs> oh, I, did, I was a bit harsh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Too late now. Your name is on the list. We will take revenge. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think it's uh, it's interesting. I mean, REST is, for me, I think REST is probably the top um, technology that you come across to do anything. It's as simple as that. that. That's the way I look at it. Is It's a way of communicating with, uh, with a remote server, and it's a way of representing data with a loose kind of um, uh, agreed standard on which you're going to do things. But of course, with anything exchanging data, you've actually got to have some agreed uh, um, protocol in the background. It's no good saying, oh, give me all the list of employees with the, the uh, 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 last name beginning with a B, if you can't then understand how that list is going to be returned to you and you process it. So of course, everything has to have uh, some established protocol and standards, even if the actual mechanism, the rest, you know, get and put and all the rest of it uh, for crud, uh, for example, um, uh, is, is stateless, you know, it's, uh, the idea is that you can say, create a new employee in a database, and you don't have to go through a bunch of rigmarole to get to the point where you create that new employee, you, the REST server should have some kind of way of going, okay, I understand what you mean there, without you having to set up an ongoing to and fro conversation to actually establish that and that that's the benefit of rest and it's so easy to do someone was asking about components for rest and i put a link there for uh, you know i'm biased about the blogs but a link to the um blogs.embarcadero.com because there are so many examples in there of using the rest debugger you know because it's easy to write about go into the rad studio rest debugger um, test your 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 REST server with these things, and it'll create the components for you. You paste them onto your form. That's it. You've written your program, really. I mean, 99% of the program is written for you. And uh, and um, if you then use that low-code wizard as well, well, we're all all grew out of a job shortly. So <laughs> never mind. <laughs> One strong point of Delphi I would like to mention because um, you mentioned the uh, REST components that are 
rather new, mm -hmm. not that new anymore in, in Delphi, but um, there's one component in there um, that I found useful in particular when I got started with REST and Delphi is the, there is an adapter in there that you can hook up your response of a web service to a data set. So you can still use your T data source and hook your result set from a web service into um, into your existing T data source architecture, which is very well, which is very good for browsing. It's not so much good for. I don't think there is that much of support for um, updating the data. That's when you have to look into other stuff from um, third party or Embarcadero that writes that kind of stuff. But in order to get data from a web service um, and then get access to it um, with with uh, known things like T data set, T data source, um, Delphi offers great components. And that's how I got started. I mean, this is this is also something um, I, I see in the community that uh, when, when people get started with things, I say like, hey, take this weather service and just try to get the weather for your location where you're at right now. And uh, I immediately get the response, well, that won't help me to get my employee multi-tier database up and running with web service. I said, start slow, get comfortable with REST debugger, as Ian just said, learn about how, how it works with the request, with the response. And even though somebody mentioned now, um, oh, there is HTTP that is, that is connection uh, based. Well, that might be, but REST, you have a request and you get a response. That's how it works. I have not heard so far of anything that is connection based so far no no that, that's that's the point isn't it and i i mean um there's a couple of questions here about payloads um please tell us also about payloads inside rest request and response well you know it, it really depends on what your use case is and i i have a rest server that sends back encrypted packets of, of payload so there's a uh, a header in the JSON object, and uh, they are literally, you know, I'm just using a JSON object and using the JSON library that comes with Delphi. And uh, and then one of the JSON objects is a binary object. It's got a bunch of data in there that's encrypted. Um, and there's a token in there so that it, you know, it knows what private and public key pair have been used to, to uh, encrypt things. Um, and that's a payload because that payload is actually a licensing payload. It's saying what parts of this particular product are activated and what parts are enabled for this particular user. So we obviously don't want someone to be able to just read that by going, oh, I'll just connect up with the REST debugger and test what the REST, you know, the, the, the licensing servers returns back as a REST request. But we do want to make it simple enough that a web page can do it if necessary. I mean, we don't, but, or, um, uh, a, uh, a Delphi program or or a mobile program. They can all talk to it and they can all decrypt that JSON package and that, that's uh, what payload does there. Yeah, and Ian, what you said, like um, that might, might come over as trivial if you use REST servers every day. Of course, all the information that is inside of an HTTP package is also available to all REST frameworks that I know. So for example, if you um, have certain header information in you that you want to transmit to the server. For example, there is REST clients that offer um, XML, JSON, and BASON, and, 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 and all of this, those kind of different data types, and you allow the client to select that. And how do you do that? Well, you use the, um, con the accepts, accepts colon, and then you can say, read this header field in your server and say, oh, if it's JSON, return JSON. If it's this, return that. So all that is in HTTP is actually also available. That's, I think, one of the strong points of this new architecture. You don't reinvent the wheel. Instead, you base all this stuff on existing well-known theories. Um, and Ian, there's, as we're talking about performance and payloads, there's another question about um, if I read stuff from a database, doesn't get that really slow because each time for each request I have to open up the database again and again and again because we all know if we have a VCL application we have to connect it takes a time we get the query result we read the query result and we close um, for that case um, you have just you just have in, in my books I always write trust the database framework so if you use a database framework like FireDAG for example there is a technology called connection pooling. And what you do is you implement it 
with the rules of the database framework that it is um, suited from, for a multi-threading environment. That means you have to use certain components. With FireDAG, that's the um, FD manager component. That does everything for you, that everything works in a multi-threaded environment. And what you have to do, um, which is very important, um, you have to get a connection, a, a FD connection, but we're just talking about the connection object, the objection, uh, the connection instance. We're not talking about physical database connections here. That's what the database framework does in the background. So if you abide by the rules of the database framework that you, you get a connection for each um, request and then do your query on whatsoever and then you release the connection each time by putting it back into the pool, the database framework handles for you the physical connecting to the database. So is, there is literally no performance issue. Even the first first time, you might notice something, but like there is no connection um, delay or anything like that. That is cost because you use the REST server. Um, professional modern database frameworks. I personally only know FireDAC. Um, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, and, and Wagner, I promise this is the only plug uh, look at my hands-on books because they're exactly I go into that <laughs> into that detail right there, like how to connect to a database and also looking at the requirements that you need to have, how how your database can be can use connection pooling because not you have to set up the connection in a certain way. There, there is a kind of heavyweight uh, TMS uh, kind of representation here. And, and yeah. uh, everybody knows I'm a big fan of TMS as well. It's not my fault they write good stuff, but what, what can I do about it? I mean, you know, it's very difficult to be horrible if the stuff works well. So, I mean, there, you know, I think the, the uh, official Embarker error this time would be there are plenty of other component vendors who also offer services and things like that. Yes, there, and there's but, also, uh, and there's also, Bruno will hate me for saying this, but there's, of course, um, open source REST frameworks um, that can be used that have a different feature set. You know, it doesn't mean this one is right, this one is wrong. You have to find your way around and you have to make a decision what's best for your business. That's all I can say. There, there was a commenter on the blog um, today, actually, about uh, um, we were talking about .NET or something, some article about someone saying, oh, .NET's dead, which was a joke. I mean, they, they, they didn't really mean that. It's not dead. It's just they were saying it's evolving in a different direction. And uh, one of the things they were saying was that, oh, with the community edition, you know, there would be much greater uptake if it was much more powerful. And uh, and uh, I, re I think the open source was the way to go, um, which is fine. And as I pointed out to them, that's absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, if you're going to go down the open source route with a com commercial library like uh, the TMS staff and, and some of the other people as well, um, you know, you're getting some added value in there. If you can find a free open source library that does exactly what the commercial library does, then why would you not use the open source library? Well, there are some reasons, like, you know, you might want commercial grade support that might not be available in open source. It may be that you prefer to have someone to blame. Uh, you know, if it's a, if it's a commercial product, and something goes wrong with the commercial product, you want to be able to go back to the, the vendor and say, this does not work, I need it fixed this afternoon at 3 p.m. or we're gonna sue you back to the Stone Age. With an open source project, in many ways, the license that comes up says that there is really no, um, you know, comeback on that, you know, uh, there is no, uh, which is a good good thing because you know you're getting it for free and the idea is you get the source for you can look at what's going on and you know fiddle around with it but um but likewise you know many open source projects not all of them but many of them are either sparsely maintained or they're maintained by people who it's not their primary source of income and all of us without exception on this panel today you know I've got bills to pay, rent or mortgages to pay, families to keep, and you know, expensive hobbies like computer uh, equipment to maintain. And that means that we have to go out and earn an income. And if we can't earn an income through open source alone or a freemium model where we have a product that we produce that is free 
but if you pay extra then you get some additional support or you get a copy of the source code or something which is not open source you know but you know that kind of thing then um then we're obviously going to have to do the stuff that pays our bills we have to prioritize it unless we've got so little time that that uh, is required for our um, commercial product that we can afford to luxuriously you know answer questions and open source and the reality is don't care who who it is it's not going to happen now if you have thousands of people maintaining an open source project um like some of the the bigger open source libraries that are out there like the json libraries and things like that are maintained by dozens of people not just one person doing it part-time then maybe there is there is some kind of um commercial um comfort in knowing that there there are dozens of people who've got an interest and maybe be able to, comp to uh, contribute some time but the reality is and this is my personal experience the reality is that many open source projects actually suffer from the fact that they're not something that are being commercially maintained and you're not paying for them and therefore there's not the same financial imperative for the person to actually do something for that open source I'm not saying open source is a bad thing I'm just saying that when you're talking about a business and your components are integral to your product and the open source maintainer either stops maintaining it or they decide that they're going to arbitrarily go and uh, produce a new version that's incompatible with the old version oh well we've decided that the way we did that in the open source is no good we're going to go on and do a different product that's similar but it's not going to be the same which has happened several times you're then down an alleyway oh well you've got the source you can make changes yourself to fix it Come on, you know, the whole point of component-based development, it, uh, particularly with things like REST and stuff like that, is someone else has done the hard work. I don't need to learn how TCP IP works. I don't need to know how HTTP works in the background. I don't need to like, write a JSON library because I could, but I don't want to write a JSON library. I can go and get it and, and either pay for it or, or find the open source. But if it's, con if it's if my commercial product relies on some source code and i'm being paid and my personal financial liability is because of that then it's a, it's a, a, a judgment call whether you're going to pursue a company now the company the commercial company for the commercial product could go bust as well it's not without risk but quite often that's not the case yeah and they could decide to stop you know selling the product there, or there's never there's never a, a right answer I, I know i know companies not small companies that have policies to not use, uh, to only use open source uh, frameworks. And I know companies that the policy, their policies is just not use free open source stuff, only commercial stuff. So it's uh, it really depends. But I agree that uh, many open source frameworks, even the ones that have many maintainers, it many of them are kind of there is no owner of the framework. It's like uh, well, you, no you, can take example, you can take an example, for example, of um, Visual Studio Code, which people would say is an open source uh, IDE and editor, okay? Except it has got the weight of Microsoft behind it. And it, it has got Microsoft uh, developers and some other organizations as well, but mainly Microsoft behind it to ensure that that product succeeds. There are products out there like, um, oh, is it Blocks or something, which is a C++ editor, some, some open source uh, products that have suffered because they're open source and have only had a limited amount of people that would be able to contribute time towards it. Um, you know, even the, um, some of the, the Python GUI type stuff, Again, it's down to whether we've got enough people that can be thrown at a project in order to keep it going. Visual Studio Code is so huge, they do get a lot of contributions from people, but the only reason that it gained the traction that it did, in my opinion, is because Microsoft put their full weight behind it. Microsoft had deep enough pockets that they could say, we will get some people and we'll give them some time and we will put some money into polishing this product and making it get off the ground. You know that's a that's a luxury for many open source uh, 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 systems. 
I know plenty of open source maintainers out there would love to have one hundredth of the amount of money that went into Visual Studio Code being supported to gain that traction, that, that kind of promotion by someone big like Microsoft, you know? There has been, because you've been talking, you probably couldn't keep track of the questions panel. Um, yeah. There has been there has been a remark um, on uh, because you mentioned the uh, REST debugger that is um, part of uh, Red Studio. There is of course another different market for tools that allow you to test your REST APIs or web service APIs or whatever you want to call it. Um, there were two others mentioned for example postman is very popular po postman even allows you to to simulate like stuff like hey let's 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 shoot off a million requests in in 10 minutes and see what happens so if you there want, is a nice I, one for visas to the code as well yes <laughs> and uh, i use myself telerik fiddler um i used it even before when the company was different i would say that's old i am i even though i without the Telerik in front of it. Um, yeah, that's that's a whole different market. Another thing um, we have mentioned so far is um, that also helps with uh, these kind of things to do documentation for your um, REST APIs is, um, is the um, ability to automatically generate documentation for your web services which um, I only know Swagger, that's the one that, that comes to mind right away. And a lot of, um, of um, REST APIs or REST frameworks offer generation for their classes for the Swagger UI so that you can browse your, your API without, without any issues. You can even offer users the ability to do um, requests, test requests, and, and the user interface um is um is automatically generated it's and uh i don't know about the i think other frameworks have it as well i know that xdata has that kind of generation in there that if you have to find your service methods your service requests that um you automatically out of the box get the swagger ui um and that allows you to cooperate with other developers you, you talk the same language and uh, I think I don't want to drive the discussion here, Ian, um, but I'm quite sure we sh should also go to the uh, very obvious thing that we have mentioned so far is because you use REST APIs and JSON as a format, you don't limit yourself to any programming language, to any device. It's, it's the world is the limit, as I always say. Yeah, sorry, I muted myself as I was typing. Yeah, there's a lot of questions about um, authentication and authorization. And people say, oh, what about auth and OAuth and all the rest of it? And um, some Don Pot said, socket client slash server. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, there, there are a lot of protocols out there for communicating things, you know, that we've talked about in the past as well. but. Um, Stomp and a few few other um, technologies. REST is really a, a kind of um, state of being. I suppose it just goes against exactly what we were talking about. We should say there was no state to it, but but, but REST is REST is um, you know it's more of a, a slightly over encompassing idea, I think. And, and uh, overall, when they're talking about uh, authorization. What are you guys' uh, thoughts on that? Because um, I'm not quite sure what they mean by that there's a problem with that because I've never found a problem with that. I mean, are they talking about JWT tokens or do they mean OAuth 2 or something? Because, um, you know, there are libraries there to support all of that. I don't quite understand what they're saying is the problem exactly. No, no idea. <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, I'm keeping away from that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll rub with that a bit then. Um, uh, who was it that asked that question? I don't, so, oh, Alex. Uh, Alexander Tregubov. 
Okay, I apologize if I'm saying your name wrong, but hey, everybody says my name wrong over here anyway. They call me Iron all the time. Um, so, <laughs> which is weird because Ian's an American name here as well. Um, so he's saying, in fact, if you add uh, any authentication, if you add any authentication scheme to REST, you have to pay attention to authorization state, which is on top of REST. But in Delphi, the Delphi world, um, data slash REST server, it can't be abstracted away from the framework. Developers um, have to maintain this state, tokens, cookies, credential. These frameworks um, need to have the ability to add control for that state in the request response context. Well, um, uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding the problem here, but um, with most libraries, you pass your authorization token that you get. So you initialize the conversation uh, with the REST server by saying, the first REST request I have to make is to say who I am and with what you know it decides whether I am allowed to do something. Yes, that is a state, that is an authorization state. And as we said right at the very beginning, it's even um, partly a kind of database uh, state as well, because most REST servers start and make the connection to the database so that the database is not having to reconnect 15 million times, you know, an hour um, when you get in REST uh, requests. But there is a state as such in a REST request in that you can pass tokens over that are authorization tokens, and that is a state. Yes, that is a state that the, the um, server has to get into. Most of them, it depends on the implementation, you know, Java tokens and, and um, OAuth2 and stuff like that. You know, you still have to have some form of token which goes in the REST request. Most of these um, REST servers have an API, and in there, they've always, nearly always got some way of saying, before you do anything else, you've actually got to authenticate to get some kind of token. So in answer to your question, Alexander, um, if I understand you correctly, yes, there is a state of authorization and that's, that's not something you're gonna get away with. Otherwise it's an open REST server that can just give data to anybody. You know, a lot of them, I've seen a few that have got a username and password that get sent over in the REST request. Which is, um, yeah. you, you know, I don't. I, yeah, I know, you you uh, <laughs> you authenticate so that you get a token. With that token, right. the server is able to identify who you are, and that way, it authorizes certain service messages for you, which is the authorization. So, um, yes, thanks for the reminder. We do know that there is a difference between authentication and authorization. Very difficult in uh, if if you're a German native speaker because those terms get even closer together in the German language. So I appreciate that we have this meeting in in English. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, don't ask me. To, I, 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 Olaf Monian is always the person who comes up with some I got a job title or something in German, and I just remember that. As far as I think I can speak English, well, I definitely couldn't ever speak German anywhere near as well as I can speak English. So, uh, not without some operation around my teeth and my tongue, because I clearly do not have the mechanism inside my mouth to even begin to pronounce some of these words. I'm sure it's the same for Brazilian as well, right? Is that some kind of Brazilian uh, uh, phrases, I'm sure, that are native to Brazil that uh, I'm all right, or maybe I'm not, I don't know. Wagner's looking at me as if he's, uh, I'm crazy, I think. So. <laughs> and uh, as, as Ian tried to say, authentication also depends on the framework that you use, how difficult it is. Like, um, uh, this is the, just for example, if you need to, I, I wrote, and, and these, these videos are available for free, they're all using Delphi components. Um, I wrote a REST client for the Fit, Fitbit web API, and it uses the, um, for authentication, you have to use OAuth2. And this is literally what Bruce McGee mentioned, where like there's a difference between if you have many open source products or if you pick one product that offers you all the authentication stuff that is there that you have to look around. And if you buy a commercial product with support, you usually get a little bit faster to what you need. And with this Fit, Fitbit Web API, I was able to derive from a class that is part of the... Uh, cloud framework that um, TMS, for example, has available. So the OAuth is literally implementing two 
or three methods and it's done and you don't have to deal with anything you know and then you have your then you're authenticated for your client and uh, if you uh, want to do a certain implementation on the server side i'm quite sure that the different um server offerings have means for example wagner's solution always uses um, the term middleware where you can put certain functionality into the server and he uses the term middleware for that so you add certain modules to your server that gives it certain capabilities for example jwt is a middleware that you literally drag and drop into your component and boom you have jwt support you just then of course need to supply the events that then hook into your database or whatever in order to do the authorization and authentication for both i think many yeah. people get confused about many beginners get confused about how to properly authenticate to a rest server especially when we talk about the stateless stuff i think that's the the confusion that he adds how to authenticate to something that is supposed to be stateless and well as a first you have to every request has to send again the the authentication uh, mechanism the authentication token so you cannot authenticate in one request and in the second request you don't send anything that will be stateful so you have to every request you have to re prove that you are yourself again send the authentication information and that authentication information which is usually a token or a password but usually a token the server has to in every request has to check that token and check if it's a valid token how to do that there are, there are many options which is checking the database if the token exists in the database usually for a better performance you you can have an in memory database or a cache database like redis or something like that that you check the token in the in the in that cache or your token can be self-contained in the sense that you don't have to go to any database or any other storage to check if the token is valid that that's what js web token is and it, it confirms people get confused by it because how can i authenticate from a token without going to a database or to some storage to check if the token is valid because the token is signed so you check if the signature of the token is okay and then you can use that token without hitting a database or something like that those are mechanisms of authentication great greatest discovery ever was the idea of a public and private key pair because it really opens up the whole authentication process to, to be able to say you know is, is this package is this authentication signed and if it is signed you know provide me the proof of that in a way that can't be reverse engineered because obviously pass simple passwords uh, once someone works out what the algorithm is they can then uh, break that algorithm but with public private keys it's uh, it's not so easy because uh, you need massive resources to try and uh, factor those keys out and even then it's pointless you know because most sessions expire after a period of time um someone's saying about um said use apache Oh, oh, iOS, iOS, okay. I mean, I'm not quite sure what they mean by that, whether they're saying about load balancing or something like that, which is one of the other things we were going to talk about. Um, use Apache, Antonius was the person. Um, the, in my experience, the biggest load balancing or the one of the best load balancing and easiest to configure um, web services, if, if that's what you're going to use in the background, um, is in Nginx. Um, it, it's very, very easy to configure reverse proxies. Um, it's the config file is nice and small, and load balancing with it is absolutely simple to do. Um, when it starts to get tricky is if you've got behind there a Delphi server sitting in the background trying to receive um, uh, transactions and have them uh, load balanced uh, in the background. And it That's is spelled ng. I N X because with Engine X I would have never found it. Yeah. So it's Nginx. N G I N X. Yeah. And I'm I, a big I, fan. I, I built a I built a slide with some edge, edge proxies. Do we have access to the slides there, Ian? Uh, I don't actually. No, weirdly enough, <laughs> um, Jim Jim's got them. Um, 
He'll probably, I mean, we'll put them in the um, the chat at some point, but uh, right now, no, we don't have it. Handouts. Oh, wait, hang on. Handouts. Yes. Um, the handouts are actually just two PDFs. No, he's he's not put the uh, slides in there. We're, normally, I get access to slides as well, but uh, we're kind of a little bit um, up in the air. About slides are in there. Oh, there he is. <laughs> They're in there. They're in there. Uh the uh, REST servers multi-tier one is the slides. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, well, there you go. Um, if uh, what, Was it uh, Holger that asked about the slides? No, someone just asked about the slides. Uh, the answer is they're in the, in the handouts on the thing. Um, someone also asked about replays as well, yes. Uh, there is always, if you go to the social media on Twitter, uh, on the Embarcadero YouTube channel, um, and on the blogs, and uh, Facebook and LinkedIn, where absolutely uh, Embarcadero is everywhere, then the replays will be there. Don't worry, we will make sure you get access there, and you'll probably get an email about it as well. Um, it's uh, super busy. Right, should we go through some other questions, guys? Uh, Jim, you you want to ask any questions as well? Um, Patrick Pramatam was um, mentioning some about Bold, for example, um, saying that Bold is now um, open source. Um, if you haven't come across uh, Bold for Delphi before, it's an absolutely great product. And the fact it's gone open source is, uh, is, um, is a brilliant uh, development, shall we say. Um, lots of people asking about Holger and your discounts for your books. <laughs> Uh, I will. Is, I, I, thankfully, I have. I don't need to make up an excuse. I, I literally don't have the ability to give out any gift codes or anything like that. The, <laughs> <laughs> the publisher, hey, the publisher every penny. has allowed um, for that. So <laughs> yeah. they're, they're worth every penny anyway. So pay the full price and make the man some money. <laughs> yeah. and, and I think that's true. You know, that if you look at one of these books and you're paying, you know, I don't know what the price is in, in various people's countries, but at the end of the day, even if it saves you a couple of hours worth of programming, um, because the answer's there in front of you, and even if you just adapt it, you know, why buy the book? In, you know, why do you want the book in the first place if you're saying, oh, I want it nice and cheap? If it's going to be valuable to you, if it's going to teach you something, then it's got to be worth a little up. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, probably biased because I live in the US and I, I work for myself, and so I'm not exactly poor. Um, and perhaps it's okay for me to look from a position of privilege and say you should pay for what you're, you're using for these books and you know people's like um, uh, Alistair from uh, LearnDelphi.tv is another guy as well who um, he has some books and he has some courses you will learn so much from Alistair and people like Holger that you know I think it what the little amount the relatively small amount that you pay for these things of it's going to repay you in the knowledge you get back from it. So we're not trying to sell people's books, but at the end of the day, that's my opinion on why um, you know it's worth paying a relatively small amount of money. It's less than less than a meal out with two people. I think it's really what it works out to. Um, for reverse proxy, Apache is uh, what they were saying. Okay. Well, reverse proxy again. Um, this is not really on the subject we're talking about, but again, Ingenix does reverse proxy with uh, literally one line in the config. It's very, very easy. Um, for those of you that are watching and don't understand what reverse proxy does, if you have got a Delphi service and you cannot go to the trouble of making it HTTPS and support HTTPS, um, either because you don't have the components that can uh, implement that protocol. And there are some very, very good articles that tell you how to do that. Um, in my production or, service, I, I like to use traffic. I prefer, yeah, uh, yeah. Traffic and uh, so so let's say if some, someone has not got to the point where they've got SSL and TLS implemented, what you can do is have your Delphi program running, uh, opening on a specific port. You can then run Nginx or Apache or whatever, um, the NGINX sits between your application and the outside world, and the traffic coming into the web service comes in as HTTPS, is then converted by NGINX into HTTP, so you don't have to worry about a horrible thing to do with certificates. You do all your answering, you answer back with HTTP, and that is then converted back with NGINX back into HTTPS. Obviously, a different port, port 443 is the, the default and things like that. But the, if you use Let's Encrypt, which is the public free um, SSL um, certificate service, 
They have a thing called CertBot, run CertBot. That gives you a free SSL certificate, install Nginx from nginx.org. Um, and you have then got SSL enabled on any of your Delphi products without having to do the complicated stuff in the background. Now, this is a poor man's version of doing TLS because really you should put it into your own code so that your own server is you know, fundamentally secure and, and the traffic that's going backwards and forwards is secured by TLS or, um, or, or SSL or whatever the context is of the conversation you've got or your own role, your own encryption, depending on how you do it. But if you, if you can't do that for whatever reason, then um, the reverse proxy is that's what reverse proxy does. And weirdly enough, some people that I worked with recently who I actually respect their technical knowledge had never, they didn't understand what a reverse proxy did and also did not know how to configure one, uh, which surprised me because I'm like, I don't use these all the time. <laughs> um, but, but that's the question about Start reverse proxy. <laughs> I don't know, it wasn't you, it was somebody else. <laughs> well, you helped me. You helped me set up my first one, remember? Yes, I, I, I did I want to mention that. I thought I'd leave him to do it. But yes, I mean, it is something that uh, in my work I've had to do over the years. I've, I've had a very strange career doing all sorts of bizarre things. And so one of the things I have to do is implement um, architectural level systems, I suppose, is the way to look at it. The things that go on behind the scenes rather than just only the programs that work themselves so I've learned a lot of odd stuff and the programs that I write tend to be used in very diverse environments um, from mum and pop businesses where there's maybe three or four people with a very no network at all or a little work group or something or they could be multi-site um, WAN based um, corporates with multiple offices with lots of you know subnets and stuff like that so you know I, it's just through bad luck I've I've learned the knowledge the hard way. <laughs> you, know, you know, nobody taught me. I just I had to go and learn it on the spot. So, one, um, one remark. One remark on that topic because um, I, uh, whenever I do contracting, that's that's literally the biggest issue: SSL and uh, encryption. And what I found out again through you, uh, you, and Wagner, is that. Um, reverse proxy really makes development much, much easier because you simply develop with HTTP in mind. You don't care about encryption. You don't care about any certificates. And then you handle the encryption and certificate generation on a different level. And um, I'm working right now with also with Wagner on something on a, on a multi-tier example with web service, web application, uh, reverse proxy, certificate generation hands-on example I'm working on that right now come in September October so it will be a reproducible hands-on approach for any Windows user I might say you don't need a Linux machine you need some dedicated tools from that are now part of Windows 10 or Windows Server you need the um, Linux subsystem in order to do it but um, it literally gives you a user interface and Ian I've shown you that you've seen it mm -hmm. Um, yeah. to to automatically generate your uh, um, certificates for the domain names that you want to use and then you can simply forward those domain names to the web application to the web server and I'm I've even found a better way now to to literally put everything in a container which is I we won't touch docker today but that is literally some something that's also so fascinating we had a coffee and code talk about docker I think already and yeah. um, we'll have a code rich session for the for the listeners from Germany coming up in September. Um, I'll team up with Olaf Morning on that one to show a couple of outlooks what's possible with Delphi in that scenario. And then um, I'll be doing um, literally the next book will be on that. Like how can, because deployment is the biggest issue. How can you get certificates generated automatically? How can you keep it financially feasible? Because I've had a customer that literally called me and said like, hey, provider X charged me $800 for my certificate. And I was like, it, and, and which certificate did you generate? And he's like, I don't know what I generated, but they just sold it to me. He didn't know if he, and, and it's the same with me. I don't know what kind of certificate I need because I'm not an expert on those things. If I need a site certificate, asterisk here, subdomain, domain this, 
And that really goes all the way if you use the uh, reverse proxy approach with a tool. Um, uh, Wagner mentioned traffic. Um, I haven't looked into that. I'm, I'm way beyond that. I, I use a really, it's called Nginx Reverse Proxy Manager. It's a web interface, much simpler than traffic. Um, I guess <laughs> also much more limited in the end, <laughs> but it gets me where I need to be. So um, yeah. watch out for that. But just saying for your development, and this is what I recommend to all my customers, um, don't spend any resources on doing HTTPS on the developer level. Um, do everything, especially with the difficulty if you have different platforms. Um, anybody who has installed or tried to generate a certificate under Linux and tried to install it in Linux and um, don't don't waste time on that. Focus on your development, do it HTTP unencrypted and then add the encryption through the technology that you use. Um, and Nginx is the case that I know it makes it really, really simple. Why can I say that it's simple? Because I'm a total noob when it comes to these things and I get it working. So that's yeah. I'm not a and network I, I, administrator, I'm a Delphi developer and I get it to work. That's that's the key factor for me. Yeah, and I and I think that would be the thing that I would say as well. And in fact I've been asked by someone to write a small article about setting up a reverse proxy and using Let's Encrypt. Um, to generate free SSL certificates. If you use the CERT bot, which is completely open source and free as well, um, you install that on the server, you install Nginx, and that's that's largely the end of it. Um, it then runs a, uh, a um, Windows uh, scheduled task, um, which runs every so often, and that then renews your certificate because Let's Encrypt certificates are only valid for 90 days deliberately. Um, but uh, there's a command line you can say, you know, um, cert bot space minus minus renew and it will renew the certificate but you can actually run that as a scheduled task and so that will renew the certificates when it's time to come this means that you've got a zero maintenance zero cost um uh reverse proxy with ssl on it that will actually direct traffic anywhere so you could have uh, an endpoint that says um uh my server slash hogger and my server slash Wagner, and my server slash Gerhard, and they would actually be routed to completely different applications. So the, the, the three or four of you could actually have your own applications on different ports, no SSL involved, and the Nginx um, reverse proxy would route that traffic to the appropriate um, application just based on, say, a URL or a subdomain URL. Actually, you would need to do some DNS with subdomain, I mean, but certainly a slash and then an endpoint like that. Um, so it does all kinds of like routing, and it's very, very easy to use, um, which is which is a good thing. Um, there are some really good articles, and I ought to find find one about creating your own. Um, Make you know making self-signed certificates. I, I, did, I made a note of it the other day because I was going to post a blog about it. But um, uh, self-signed certificates on Windows is a little bit of a dark art, and you've actually got to know the commands. Well, um, I think it might have been Griggy or someone like that that posted it that said how to actually get Delphi to uh, generate self-signed certificates. Because um, if you use SSL or use TLS for your communications behind the scenes for REST or any other um, service, um, you need a certificate to do that. And actually generating a self-signed certificate is a free way of doing it. You should only use it for testing. If you're going to um, deploy a service, a commercial service, then you do need a proper certificate authority authenticated request uh, from someone like VeriSign or I think they're called Komodo now or let's encrypt and uh, Gridgy's uh, solution was actually very interesting. I think it was Gridgy, I'll, I'll need to check that, I'll post about it at some point. Um, let someone's asking the question here, um, oh, the question disappear because someone just answered it, who was that then? Let's see. Oh, does, uh, it was a Wagner that answered it. Uh, hello Wagner, I know you're in the background there, I think you're muted actually because your keyboard was making a lot of noise. Um, you can unmute if you want. Um, does Let's Encrypt now have a client to automatically renew the certificates for Windows? Um, Wagner says, yes, win at me. Actually, that's not strictly accurate. Um, it is CertBot. If you go there 
on the EFF um, CertBot site. It'll say to you, what operating system are you, uh, are you using for your web server? And you pick Windows and it'll say, okay, great. Now, are you, uh, are you um, going to be deploying it to one of the following servers? And you pick the server that it is. It will then take you to a customized web page that will give you a CertBot version for Windows. WinAcme is slightly different. Uh, if I understand correctly, uh, Wagner, WinAcme is actually a component. Um, is that right? That's, um, that allows you to make certificate requests in your app for Let's Encrypt. So what it does, um, no? Um, no, no. WinAcme Win is a tool to renew certificates on Windows. Oh, it's okay. Actually, right, I, right. I, I, I didn't know if that search bot has avail is available for Windows. Yes, it is, but, definitely. I used it today. <laughs> I guarantee you. I tried both at the time, and uh, WinAcme is it's very easy to set up. You can renew certificates by serving a local, uh, running a local server, or via DNS. There are lots of ways to authenticate, well, and uh, that's, that's enough, what I use. Weirdly enough, there is a Delphi component called WinAcme, um, which is completely. It was like I think it was fifty dollars or something. From if you paid both, I think. Yeah, but that's a, that's a different thing. Yeah, what that component does is it actually makes a request to Let's Encrypt and generates certificates for you in your Delphi program. So it takes over the, the role of the cert bot. I hear a dog in the background there. Um, takes over the role of the um, cert bot. Um, but if you go to cert bot, WinAcme, I've actually, maybe I've used it and forgotten, but I, I literally was doing one today and I did one yesterday where I used CertBot and it, it's a Windows and CertBot is from um, the EFF, the Electronic um, Freedom Foundation, I think they call themselves. I, yeah, put, I, link to, I put link to WinAcme in the, in the chat window. Right, cool, the, okay. And, and I'll do one for CertBot as well. Um, and someone says, oh, oh, there's two TMS people on this chat and neither of them mentioned this, that TMS has a free tool to create self-signed certificates. I, I actually kind of knew that as well. <laughs> uh, good point. Well, I suspect both of you now are going to have some explaining to do with Bruno. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but yes, I, I've, used, is, uh, I've used I've used WinAcme um, as well, but uh, I came to the conclusion that the time spent learning about a reverse proxy was time better spent, plain and simple, because. If you have a tool that generates the certificates for you that you can configure as complicated as you want it to be, which is updated on a regular basis, um, it is much better than signing the certificate, creating the certificates, spending a huge amount of time learning about the command line, about all. What, what was the biggest issue for me, and Wagner will remember it from, from an evening of chat messages going back and forth, to, um, if you want your certificate signed, you have to prove that it is really you that is the owner of the domain. So you have to take steps to prove that you have ownership of that domain and you can't simply um, configure something and then it works like magic. You literally have to answer a request from, from the signing authority. And uh, that was a challenge for me um, where my Delphi well, developer in LH knowledge no longer did suffice, you know, and with the reverse proxy user interface that I had, um, that was all handled automatically because this tool literally starts a web server on your machine and answers all the calls for the, for the, for the signing authority, which makes right. it literally clicking it and it works. So, yeah. but what Wagner says is of course 100% true. You have the most flexibility generating certificates using the Windows version of the um, Let's Encrypt engine, and um, that's the most flexibility. But it was overwhelming for me; I couldn't handle it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, today I was having to explain to um, I, how, how can I call it? I don't want to call him out accidentally so I'm just going to say someone I was working with rather than uh, it's not it was an IT person rather than programmer but I have to explain how um, certificates worked um, even though they've used them in the past they've actually used tools built into their hosting to uh, buy uh, certificates and as you said um, there are different types of um, level of certificates um, you know organize that organize organization authorization and um, I forget what the other one is called, uh, but uh, basically you, 
you know, it's a bit like code signing. If anybody's read the article I wrote about code signing, you can get a kind of personal level validation or a much more um, fierce, you know, you need a hardware key with a, a security uh, token inside it to uh, to authenticate. But um, lots of people, their exposure to um, um, SSL certificates, which is really what you're talking about here, and there are different types of um, certificate, lots of people's exposure is through their web host, where they pay $99 or 100 pounds or whatever, and ding, you know, your, your certificate, you answer a few questions, who are you, where, where do you work, you know, what's your business address, and then at some point in the future, some poor soul or a robot uh, application at the web host installs your certificate for you. If you work for a good host like Dreamhost, uh, then they, they incorporate uh, Let's Encrypt, so you don't have to pay anything um, for your SSL certificate. So all these people that are paying £120 or whatever I saw someone pay the other day, um, if they were hosting with someone like Dreamhost, and there are lots of others, um, they would get the SSL certificates free. But the types of certificates can be a little bit confusing because there's dot PEM, there's dot CRT, and as soon as you start to um, dig into yeah, the whole certification process, you think, oh my word, I didn't realize I was going to go and learn how to travel to the moon. I thought I was just going to, like, you know, do something to do with the web server. So it can get a little bit intense and generating. Um, correct a certificate request is also a difficult, but for me with Let's Encrypt, uh, that's kind of game over because it was free, it worked, I don't have to do anything complicated and it's automated and keeps working forever. That's the solution I can go to a customer and say, you want you want uh, encryption? Here we go then, we'll install, install the cert bot, we'll install the reverse proxy, how many, how many servers do you want that aren't protected? Okay, well, we'll do that. You still have to worry about protection across the network. If they're traveling across the internal network, you still want to consider, you know, writing your application to be secure. But if if it's actually in one particular place and the outward uh, connection is is um, HTTPS or something like that, that, that that's a good way of doing it without lots of effort. And um, you also need to be able to install the certificate into your application. If you that's that's one step we should should emphasize like if you develop like, any spot. certificates you can do anything in http your application does not change otherwise you need to bind your certificates to your application either load them dy dynamically at runtime and that is an additional development step you don't necessarily need it's not always as easy as with x data where you have a tool where you can click and then boom is this the certificate you want yes you bind it to the port and it works because as soon as you want to use Linux, why are you going to do that? You know, then you need to bind the certificate to your Apache or to, to your Nginx and simply not thinking about it and then using a solution that you simply put as a module in front of it is much, much easier. It gives you much more flexibility where you host. That's another thing. If you forward, um, gives you much, much more flexibility. And you can also, um, another thing to to remember is you focus on the development and let somebody else handle the uh, service stuff. You know, then the developer doesn't have to deal. The developer literally publishes the application to a point that the certificate forwards to, or you, you're um, sorry, the reverse proxy forwards to. Then you don't need another person that literally deploys the application. You can do that yourself, and the architecture for the certificate for the reverse proxy stays in place and you don't have to touch it. Another argument to consider. Yeah. I mean, you know, keeping away from um, the nitty gritty of actually, if you're, if you're a consultant and you're writing programs for someone else, or in my case, I'm writing programs for someone else who then sells them on as a commercial product, um, which happens a lot. I mean, the, the, some customers who are internal customers to their sales. But if you're writing a commercial product um, and it's a kind of server component, you really do want to separate the whole certification process away from your app. And you want to make it nice and easy as possible. Now, the interweb app, I, I was just working on an interweb app um, a couple of days ago. And um, that app can support both. Okay. So, if you don't, if you turn, there's a little flag that you can turn off and say, I don't care about it being secure, and then it will serve up via HTTPS. 
but if you the default is that it's looking for a certificate now it's got a default place that it looks for the certificate and the key and the certificate authority um, certificate but that is how interweb does it that's baked into the uh, interweb is it 15 i forget the versions but the latest version of it it, it will um pick that up and support it in um eon is that eon eon gip i'm not sure how to pronounce your name but uh, he or she has mentioned that um, hz have a free certificate manager as well that works with lex encrypt so um with the interweb stuff that I did, um, we decided that we didn't really want to get involved with the whole certification thing for customers because they're corporate customers. And usually what we discover that the bigger the organization and the more department heads that they have, the more meetings they have about stupid things like getting a certificate and then more purchasing departments are involved where they have to have purchase orders and then someone else has to have a meeting about who's the person to be in charge of the purchase order to be in charge of actually uh, getting a certificate because it costs money and then there's someone else who actually has to go and buy that certificate but by the time you finish there's a game of these silly whispers where something comes back and it's the wrong thing so what we wanted to do was be able to give them the ability to either say well, here's a free version of Let's Encrypt, but if you want your corporate SSL certificate, then you can put it here and it will pick it up. And uh, that then secured a REST server, which because it is partly a REST server, and it also secured a um, a custom server that, that does a custom protocol in the background um, with Stomp actually as well in the background. And um, you know that that was kind of our business modeling behind that that we didn't want people to to um, be a blocker to us say we've delivered the product and you're ready to go with it if they if they then can't uh, purchase their ssl certificate that shouldn't be a reason for us not to get paid so it's a, it's a commercial um consideration for you um when acme is installed in the same windows apache machine later when acme puts a file in the website file path and that's how they invalidate Okay, well, that's from uh, Jorge uh, and Media. Um, actually, that's with CertBot, that's not quite true. With CertBot, what you do is you can specify quite a lot of the information. So maybe this is the difference between WinAcme and CertBot. With CertBot, you can say where you want those um, certificates and keys to be created, and they can be on a network share or they can be on something else because they're just files that get created. You're then your applications can then point to where those certificates are the other thing you can have is a process that picks those certificates up at a regular basis and puts them somewhere else as well but um they're saying that when acme does the configuration the for yeah and, and in fact certbot also i think has got some ability it, it actually says on windows it can't configure it but on linux it can so i think on linux um and mac as well because it's unix based the certbot can actually do that configuration. Uh, I know CERT, but I think it's written in Python. Um, so maybe that's what's going on behind there, but I, I don't know. I just know that, you know, you, it's one of the, there's a lot of little different command line uh, things you can specify. And, you know, like yeah. most of these Linux uh, things you can, yeah. you can do. When ACME is written in PowerShell and .NET, it was purely .NET, but I think now they switched over a little bit to PowerShell as well. And right. you can literally, for the um, for this kind of thing, you can do, everything apart from carrying a, a usb flash drive to the certificate authority that's the only thing you can do but you can do <laughs> ftp you can do windaf you can everything that like a very inefficient but, way of getting your certificates <laughs> yeah but it's as yeah, ian said <laughs> yeah but as ian said like that, that's my dad's approach all the time can i just copy it and, and bring it to them drop it off <laughs> i show them by my id um no it's, it's seriously again like don't underestimate what ian said the um file formats because you sometimes get five file format a and you need b and then you need to convert from a to b and it's a major hassle and then something that we haven't mentioned so far at all is there is a public key and a private key and the private key is of course secret and the public key is what you need to um, publish and then sometimes you have a problem to extract the private key from the from the from the whole key file and then you only need the public key at some places you need both you need to combine it sometimes it's in separate files sometimes it's in the same file so and then each file can have different encryption algorithms and not each encryption algorithm is accepted by each 
encryption of uh, authority. And then if you generate, and this is what happened to the customer, let's say you request um, a, a, a certificate from a certain Windows machine and then want to continue developing on another Windows machine and then the certificate doesn't work, you can't access the certificate because it's stored in the certificate storage of the other machine. So how do you copy it from A to B? You Most of the time you can't because you have a different fingerprint. Then you are a different person if you don't use some, some Microsoft account that makes you the same person on all your computers. So this is all very, very complicated. Come on, and, come on, um, Komodo has a real problem with that as well because they do um, code signing certificates, which are very similar but not the same. And uh, with their code signing certificates, it's hilarious because the instructions say, "Open Internet Explorer," and you can then export the uh, the certificate from. The, and this was last year. I, I renewed mm -hmm. my code signing certificate last year. Re export it from Internet Explorer. It does not work on any other browser. I haven't seen their, their current uh, instructions, but I can't wait to see what happens because Internet Explorer is no more. So I'm mm -hmm. guessing Edge or Firefox um, might do it, but they did used to say that this will not work with Chrome or Firefox. So, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a kind of uh, the whole operating system needs to catch up with the, uh, the commercial uh, certificate process. Yeah. And, and well, also to I'm just find gonna, the certificate uh, where it is, right? Like sometimes it's in the browser, sometimes it's in the Windows storage. So you don't really know where it is, and then if you import yeah. it, how to import it correctly? Well, Mac, it's a Mac mess. Have, if, Macs have a keychain, uh, which is a great idea. Macintosh, uh, and in fact, iOS uh, developer certificates and stuff like that are a, a law unto themselves. I just had an absolute nightmare last week with um, certificates expiring and stuff. Always the same, but trying to get extract those, it's it's. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's painful. Nightmare. Anyway, um, just to change the subject just a little bit because we're getting towards the end of some time. Um, someone asked about um, could we have some more information on multi-tiered applications and API design? If only we had a couple of people here who know a lot about multi-tier applications. Over the, to the two TMS guys. Where's where's uh, where's Wagner? Oh, he's Wagner. Your screen's gone black. I hope you're still here. Yeah. He, he, I think he got a phone call or something. Oh, okay. It's not suddenly nighttime there or something. <laughs> Power's off. Yeah. yeah, he's the man for um, multi-tier. Um, yes. he, he, yeah, so he, uh, I think um, the question there is really a sort of broad um, discussion about multi-tiered. Um, if we talk briefly about um, um, you know, the Embarcadero server um, type technology and how that sits in the middle and reset. I mean, anybody that's ever used PA server, for example, has, has um, used the uh, the servers there, the server technology. But I think um, they're also saying, I mean, they're saying RAD server, which is exactly what I'm talking about. So RAD server, it's also called a few other things as well. But um, where do they, it says, where do they, what do I do to read more about two-factor authentication in use with Brad Server? I actually don't know the answer. Um, maybe Jim will know the answer to that. I think he's still around in the background somewhere. Um, that's one to look up on because I, I simply don't know. I haven't used Brad Server enough. Um, I know there isn't, as far as I know, there's not any components specifically for that in Brad Server, but two-factor authentication is just using a second factor for authentication besides passwords. Um, so they could so put in could, a custom. They could put in a custom um, hook and say on authenticate. Then they they need to come up with some token or something. Is that what you're saying? What yeah. You so get? if they had a, you use the password. The Red server has the user management password built in. But yeah. then I guess if you would have to do like a a code or a code generator for one time password, which there are components and libraries for Delphi to do that. But I'm trying to think how you would integrate that into RAD servers? That's an interesting question. Yeah, I'm not really sure on that. You you could do it as a, this goes back to the whole stateless, <laughs> whether you uh, generated your token or not, I guess. And I'm not sure, good question, yeah. Yeah, okay, so I think we're gonna say, we're not sure, we have to have a think about that. <laughs> yeah, 
I, I mean, RAD server is, is is the kind of official Embarcadero middleware. There are lots of others, and then these two guys, Wagner uh, uh, and uh, Holger, will, I'm sure have some input on that. Um, and Gerhard, I'm not sure what your experience is with um, uh, middleware. Middleware, is, uh, I had someone ask me what, they were talking about this uh, cloud server they wanted to implement, and they had a problem that they were having everything monolithic. It was all on one machine, and they wanted to make it so that they could have a diverse um, setup where they would have multiple machines connecting to a database. Um, but then they started saying, well, what if we had N number of machines connected? Um, you know, we wanted to look at load balancing, and we want to look at this and that. But also, we, want to, we, we don't want to have a MySQL server sitting there um, we might want to change it so that we have a um, PostgreSQL, uh, PostgreSQL, PostgreSQL, yeah, Postgres uh, server um, uh, in the background. And in fact, um, that was the direction they went. They had MySQL or Postgres, and you could pick it at the installation. The way they did that was the middleware had a data abstraction layer, which is the way you should be doing things anyway, talking to a data abstraction. And the data abstraction would then talk to a specific implementation. So if you chose to have um, the MySQL um, version, it would run a, another middleware server. So there's a middleware with a middleware that talked to the MySQL. Okay. But the for the, the middleware that was actually talking to that second part of the middleware was all just interfaces. It was just a standardized interface. And as long as your middleware for MySQL and your middleware for Postgres SQL. Um, use those I interface objects, um, it worked and it was a great solution. It was very effective. The actual uh, middleware server implementation they used was a custom rolled one. Um, you know, they, they decided to go that direction, but they could have used something like Xdata, um, plug for TMS there. Ching, Bruno, send me some money. And uh, I'm, I'm kidding. And, um, and uh, any of the other implementations, there are a lot out there. Um, and if you look around, there are open source ones as well. Um, and if you want examples, I have to do it, Ian, one more time, and that's it. Like, go for it. Because I haven't gotten, we've gotten concrete questions like about um, where can I get an example about um, authentication, <laughs> authorization, working with databases. So this is the, the tiniest Tom, book I have written. Wow. That's, that's the number one. That's that's the one where you get an example with a huge database, 8 million, da 8 million records. You learn how to build... REST JSON server and reporting. That is, um, and, and the question was pretty direct. Is it is it directed at TMS? Yes, because that's the reason why TMS, the logo is on here. Um, it uses their XData framework from Wagner and it uses their web technology. But the principles that you learn with FireDAG, for example, they can be applied to any other framework. And recently, like just last week, this one, um, this is like how to build cross-platform multi-tier. This gives you all the information about how to build even more um, scalable multi-tier applications for the web, for mobile devices, and so on. Um, building on the book number one. So if you haven't read number one, you might feel a little bit overwhelmed um, because I, d I think it's only fair that I don't repeat stuff that I've already written about in other books. So, um, so number one might be a good start, and if you like the way that I convey stuff, maybe you give book three another shot. Yeah, and um, and again, I mean, it, there are other books around, and there are plenty of um, videos as well. But uh, you know, we've got the author here of that book, which happens to be relevant. So that, why else would we ask them all? You know, and it's got some relevance to it. Um, Wagner. Would, Am I right in saying you actually work on X data? Is that correct? Or partner still listening? Hello. Uh, Ian, uh, there is a you know on your uh, when you create create your data snap server, uh, you get one server component. But I mean, you can add uh, as many server components as you like, and that can even connect to different databases and you can fracture your queries into these different servers and you can use the same data snap server but if you find that actually uh, the load is getting even so high that that is not possible 
you can always connect to from your client to two different servers. Mm. So well, uh, yeah, there's, I, there's, I think... there's really yeah. Sorry. Um, no, no, carry on. I, I think you're right. I mean, the, the point there is that what you're saying is you can do a kind of um, poor man's load balancing by saying, well, hang on, I think I'm I'm getting a poor response from um, one server. I'll connect to another. But you, I think you're also saying, well, if you choose whether you're going to go to this server, you can also say, I'm going to go to that server and have the client um, talk to the, the middleware data snap servers um, yes. independently. Which of course is absolutely true, and the, as you also point out, one data snap server, the technology behind it could go to different databases or even a no database because it could be that's good, you know, some custom created objects and something like that. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of middleware. I think anywhere where you're putting something in between what the user interface does and what is going on behind the scenes with queries and views and and um, store procedures is a, is a is a massive bonus because once you start abstracting away from the implementation of mysql and from the implementation of sql server and from the implementation of postgresql then uh, which is another name i always stumble over but uh, where, once you uh, abstract away from that implementation it gives you so much more flexibility to actually uh, you, you know, suddenly you feel like Superman because your program can do some things that people go, or oh, how? You mean I can pick the database technology? Because I really hate MySQL and I don't want to pay for SQL Server, but Postgres is really cool. And you can say, well, yeah, go on, use what one you like. That's the that's the benefit of the the middleware. And as you pointed out, Gerhard, you know the um, the uh, uh, Data snap and and these other middleware technologies allow that to happen. It's true with Xdata as well. Xdata is, um, a, I think, it's a slightly different approach because of the tool that you use to create the um, the links and things like that. But any middleware is, is is a bonus, and it's surprising how many people don't use it and use direct connections to a database and then direct queries. And uh, all of a sudden, they're tied to you know it's got to be the data's got to be on this server um, because that's where everything is. Whereas if you've got middleware, then your database server yeah. can be up here somewhere with uh, you know all sorts of RAM and could even be a Linux machine. It doesn't matter. The middleware, which might be Windows because that's the tool that you've got to write with, could be some here and the client side could be a cell phone running iOS. And you've got you know a fire monkey app that's that's running on there and talking to the middleware and off you go so abstractions definitely the whole really the beginning and the end of why middleware is a, is a good thing um so other questions oh someone asking can, can we do live coding sessions jim uh, i'm mentioning this uh quite a lot yes think, actually i do have plans to introduce a new stream doing that but i uh, putting some stuff together for that so yeah it'll be coming soon uh, stay tuned to blog.embarkadero.com. We'll have some details on that. Definitely. I hear there's a really good article on there about the future of internet as well, uh, future of computing. Um, <laughs> joking. But uh, the, the purpose of Tea Coffee and Code is really to talk and, and to get a bunch of developers in a room and talk about loosely about subjects that, um, that we've got a topic for and, and really to not have a script and i know that means sometimes that some people don't get to talk as much as others some people are less talkative and some people <clears throat> more talkative um you know some british people so uh, it just depends on the personality of the people but really the response we have had back from people about the tea coffee and code sessions sessions has been very positive um people seem to like the the style we do try and do replays so that you can scroll through the bits where i'm talking and get to the you know what wagner's got to say or gerhard's got to say or holger and if you don't like to hear about books you can scroll over holger as well but uh <laughs> but i'm kidding <laughs> but um you know tea coffee and code is is very specifically aimed at a conversation um we have got a lot of sessions coming up that are like the learn delphi kind of thing and the desktop first conferences um which you'll see on the social media and on the blogs and um, publicized those are much more code focused um sessions there are people there like myself and some other mvps and and 
um, non even people that have got no uh, connection with Embarcadero talking about and demonstrating techniques and methodologies that are specifically code focused and um, more knowledge based rather than than the conversational system that we're having at the moment. So conversational, yeah, the session I think is what we're saying. So for uh, 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 and for other uh, people, I've added some useful tips, tricks, and traps in the slides on the middleware. You know, those cool. are things you picked up when uh, you really work with it. Uh, not in a manual, those are things you experience, you know. It, yeah, yeah and I think that, that, that's the benefit of having the MVPs on here and having uh, people on here that, you know, the questions are very useful because they give us some guidance on things that people don't necessarily know. We think, oh, really? You didn't know that? Well, we thought everybody knew this, you know, but, uh, but the tips and tricks from, from, you know, some of us that are not quite 21 anymore. And I, Gerhard, I'm sure you're really only 21. You've just lived a very hard life. Uh, but um, <laughs> but some, of the, some of us that are a little bit uh, um, older have obviously been through the, the loop a few times. We've made a lot of mistakes. We're not saying that we know the answers because we were good. It could be we know the answers because we screwed it up and we know what went wrong. So, you know, don't, don't, be, uh, don't be fooled here. It's, it's, it's not necessarily the knowledge of the the genius uh, in Cella Genta, you know, it's it's also down to a uh, hard experience the bad way. <laughs> We've all had bad yeah. days. That's why we all drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> you know, it's, it happens a lot. Uh, oh, and it still does. You know. Still get up every day and I write code. I say this to people. I may be an MVP, but I am a working developer. I get up, I start work roughly about 6.30, 7 a.m. in the morning, and I, I sit here and I bang out code. The only days that I don't do that is, and uh, Holger's doing it. And in fact, we on the blog, we're doing some interviews with a lot of developers um, with various questions. Uh, Wagner's going to be on it, and I might send one to Gerhard, actually. I haven't sent one to him, but um, where we're trying to interview some developers and say, hey, for people that are not professional developers or people that are hobbyists or people that are thinking about I might be interested in being a developer. What's it like to be a developer? That's part of why these conversations exist to see that we are just normal people, and uh, and that you know what our own personal routines are, might be in connection with code and our own personal um, ethos, of work ethic is because everyone's different. I know Holger is very different to the way I write code. I write code very differently to um, the way that I'm sure Wagner does it, and Gerhard and Jim. Um, but there's no right way not, to do it. Just, and it's, not it's, at six six thirty in the morning. Not at six thirty in the morning. I'm a morning person. What can I say? I, I, I just <laughs> don't I can do anything. But yeah, I mean, that's why I drink so much coffee. But uh, uh, <laughs> but um, we wanted to kind of you know um, draw back the veil on this thing that we do, development, so that. When we're talking about things like this, um, you know, you can see that we're real people. This is not fake. This is not a pre-arranged conversation where we've had eight hours to rehearse what we're going to talk about. In fact, most of us just turned up and got on with it. But also, we we haven't polished our demonstrations like some of the Microsoft ones. Occasionally, can be a little bit. You can tell they're super polished. Hey, another cool thing, you know. And, and, Kind of bugs me. I mean, what they show is great, but the the kind of super polished style of most presentations, not just Microsoft, but other people as well, um, can make people have suffer from imposter syndrome, where they feel like they couldn't possibly be that good because look at how cool these people are. Those people have had days to rehearse with peers that are ex experts in their field. This conversational style that we're going for, and the questions that we're trying to, the interviews that we're trying to do, are trying to show you that. All you people now that are on this webinar are the same as all of the rest of us. We've got a lot of experience because we're old and we've been doing things. And you know? <laughs> uh, apart from Mark, no, he's just young, really. But uh, but we're just developers, and so yes, uh, as someone says here, Paul Blaze, he likes the conversational style. That's what Tiki Offer in the Code is about, um, and hopefully we answer questions on the way. So um, we should probably address a few other questions. We started a bit late, but we're kind of at the end of things. Good decisions come from experience. Experience comes from making bad decisions, says Bruce McGee. Yes, I have made many, many mistakes over the years. 
Um, I shan't go into all of them. And as I say on uh, interviews, um, don't look at my old code. Um, <laughs> don't look at my new code sometimes as well, but uh, don't look at my old code. Um, somebody says, how can they use uh, Boolean variables in XE5 with the T-REST component? The answer is speech marks instead of true or false or one or zero. I have to handle the Boolean data type correctly. Um, we depends don't on the say... framework and depend, <laughs> depends on, yeah, first of all, they, you have to keep the syntax of the JSON format, and then it depends on the serializer and deserializer you use, how you configure it. Because just like we said about REST, by now JSON has become a standard, but when I was writing my PhD thesis, it wasn't a standard yet. So you have to look how your serializer or deserialize. The easiest thing is just serialize a class that contains a Boolean variable and look what the output is and then use that as the input. That's that's the easiest trick in the book, I think, how to do it. But there is no general, oh, it's a one or it's a zero. It literally depends on what you're using. And then if you use different um, uh, mapping tools, for example, Aurelius from TMS, which is their ORM tool, has certain things that they um, serialize a certain way. And that is what you have to abide by if you want to send something to it for the framework to understand it. That's literally the short answer. Cool. Someone said um, the super webinar. Uh, a lot of positive comments. Thanks. Uh, you know, I appreciate people saying uh, we, we're not fishing for compliments, by the way, because you know we're just doing this thing anyway. But. Uh, a lot of positive comments, but one person says, uh, oh, apart from the person says, all of us are wonderful. Thank you very much. We think you're wonderful too. Thanks for coming. That that really helps. I mean, it encourages us to turn up and do these things by the feedback that we get, um, and including negative feedback. If you think we're doing something wrong, um, let's have an honest conversation about it. You don't need to be rude about it. Oh, you're all a bunch of idiots. You better... If you think we're doing something wrong, let us know. We'll take it on board and we'll have an honest conversation about it. You know. It, you mean, Ian, they have, you mean they have caught on there that we are a bunch of idiots? <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I wouldn't said that. But, uh, you know, I mean, all I'm saying is if they think we're crazy or, or uh, let's put it another way, slightly more subtly. If well, someone thinks that we could have done something a bit better in the future. Well, the, you know, the, the, the field is so vast. And, uh, you know, during this, you can see how many people use different frameworks and a few that I don't even know about, you know. So uh, it's uh, very interesting to see how people uh, actually solve their problems and share it here with us. That is very nice. There are a few. I would like to go and have a look at a few frameworks. So I think it's very useful. If everybody got everything right first time, there would only be one database system. And it would be my SQL, but uh, there would only be <laughs> one database management system because otherwise there'd be absolutely no point. You wouldn't need SQL Server, you wouldn't need uh, Postgres, you wouldn't need MySQL because they're all very similar. I mean, there's a SQL standard, right? You know, see, it's standard SQL. So why have a different database? And the answer is because there's always more than one way to, to uh, come to a solution. And actually, all of these um, things have uh, advantages and disadvantages. X data, great middleware. It's got very specific, um, um, uh, you know, like the remote data and all the rest of it. Very, very specific um, uh, benefits. The same as RAD server does as well, but there are other solutions as well. But, uh, you know, uh, Holger, you were going to say something about X data. Yeah, I would like to mention two, two things because you're concluding things right now because there has been feedback. Uh, hey, we would like more practical hobbyist approach and uh, just building things like Raspberry Pi. So I know three things that are going on, like the UK user group, you, Ian will give me the name of, of the of the team lead there because I always mix it up with, I think it's Chapman. Jason, uh, he calls himself Jask, I think. Um, I really should, I think it's Jason Chapman. Yeah, um, and they I do. apologize, Jason, if I've got your name wrong. Uh, even though I'm British, I've lived here long enough now that the, uh, the whole, uh, uh, yeah, ownership they, that they do changed. long coding sessions and they invite people from Embarcadero. Some some of their streams are like four hours long. And then there is um, Brian Mitov. 
he's an MVP as well. He has uh, no Boyan, not Brian. Boyan. Boyan. Brian, Boyan. Brian. He would be a Brian if he was born in the UK. So. <laughs> <laughs> so Hello, my name's like, Brian. All right. <laughs> yeah. So he does all kinds of stuff with um, technical stuff. So with Arduino. So very interesting, Boyan. very practical Raspberry Pi. Boyan, okay. Sorry, Jim. Boyan is one one of my heroes. The guy yes, is an absolute he, he's hero. amazing, and he does it all. And his stuff is all available. You can look at it. It's it's amazing, and uh, that's that's why he became MVP of the year last year or something. So really deserved. Yeah. And then I know of um, this name. I'm definitely gonna butcher because it's French. So I'm just gonna say Patrick. Okay. Patrick. So he has, uh, yeah. Hey. Exactly. He has he has a Twitch stream. He's going to tell me. So, so he does all sorts of stuff is on his Belgian, Twitch stream. Is it Patrick in Belgium or is he French? I apologize, Patrick. I should know the difference. But yeah, but uh, yeah, there is a difference. Yeah, but uh, and we don't want to be. Um, but he has a Twitch stream. So if you look on Twitch, which is usually for gaming, you know, they have great streaming capabilities. And he has something there with Delphi and and then of course our friend Alistair from I'm sure he's from New Zealand. Um, he has like hours and hours and hours of practical stuff on his YouTube feed, but also does like uh, all sorts of stuff. So those are literally yeah. the ones that I would like to mention that have like very code based approaches. And finally, um, we Patrick, uh, Patrick is uh, sorry Patrick is French actually <laughs> I just ah, <checked>. okay yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> finally Wagner and I are to be found on the TMS Web Academy which is uh, uh, also a learning system where you can learn more about it's it's going to be TMS based of course um, but you will find us there showing code examples and stuff like that live and recorded but not only uh, Wagner and I are present there also Bruno uh, Jalt and uh, I think Peter also did, did a course so everything very practical and not as formal yeah and prepared wanna, as, as, as Ian just, just said like I just want to mention one question as well because this is a really good question someone is saying about an FMX example with uh, AR on Android um, and then someone saying well what's AR AR is augmented reality uh and uh and it's it's very cool um you know it's the kind of thing where you can point your phone at say i don't know a, a label on a box of cereal or something like that and it comes up and shows you recipes or some other things as well so the augmented reality could be you know where you see these things where people have got avatars imprinted on their faces so that they look like cats or or something like that augmented reality is that um that that that's what ar is and yes it would be very interesting to see an fmx example there's no reason why it can't be done um you know so uh i don't know about jim uh, he he's still in the background but we're kind of getting towards um the two hour mark um yeah just one I, comment here yeah. Liam. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think Finally. most people Sorry about that. For so those people who are using REST, uh, the older compilers, you know, they would find that REST system components evolved a lot towards the new compilers. Really worthwhile to upgrade to the latest compiler to get the full REST capability. Well, there's a lot of good reasons, but yes, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. The REST and the JSON uh, libraries as well have moved on a, a lot, I think. Um, Wagner, do you have any final comments that you might have? Yeah, I have to go actually, sorry, but yeah. uh, so <laughs> I'll use my final comments. Thanks, yeah. thanks guys for inviting me and thank you all for attending here. And I hope to see you next week, maybe I'll be here. And for one final note, I invite you to, I put the link on the chat, I invite you to visit the links I put there. And if you don't have time, especially one article I have in my blog about uh, cloud services, REST services, it's for beginners. Uh, there is an article in a video, so you can get an idea of the, the common pitfalls you might have when you are starting this, this world. All right. Thank you guys, I have to go. Sorry for not uh, being here for the okay. last, final, last final minutes, but We're thanks for the conversation. We're going anyway. Um, Go, Wagner. Go, go, go. <laughs>
Okay, so um, with regard to the UK Developers Group, I should have a disclaimer, I suppose, that I used to go to the okay. UK Developers Group back in the day um, when it was at the Polish, uh, um, I think it was called the Polish, uh, no, I can't remember, it was like a heritage centre or something like that in, in uh, London. I used to go there, very fond of it. Uh, I remember they used to have very good uh, pierogies. So. Uh, they've moved, I think, uh, but actually but now they're on. It was called Great Britain at the time already, was it? <laughs> yeah, it was, so it was already good. a monarchy. That's it, good. It, it was, yeah, Victoria was still on the throne, and uh, no, but it wasn't quite that long ago. But uh, I, I remember um, UK Development Group with a lot of fondness, and um, I know um, uh, uh, Craig Chapman, for example. Craig and I met at that UK Developer Group. That's how long we've known each other. Um, back in the 90s, I think, sometime like that. So uh, they now are doing Zoom meetings. I noticed that a while ago, but I, um, Robert mentions that as well. So if you are a UK developer, then um, go along. Um, I have to be careful when I go to the UK developers group, because I'm sure there are people that go, oh, I remember when I used to work with you. And <laughs> have, a, have a complaint. Okay, um, uh, Holger, anything final before we go? I think we're done. Really. Thanks for the invite. It has been great again. Okay, today. I'm saying goodbye, everybody. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you're still there. Thank you for the opportunity. Sorry, Gerhard. Go ahead. Gerhard, hello. He can't hear me. Sorry. Yeah. No. No. I'm saying. Uh, yeah. Sorry. I. Yeah. No. I'm. I'm locking out. If you guys don't mind. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, and we'll talk again. All right. Thanks. Bye. Sure. No problem. And Holger. Before you go, any final messages? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the invite. I think I've taken up. Uh, I, I said all I wanted to say. We got into a lot of questions today. It was great being here as you always. Give the advice. <laughs> and uh, yeah, if if uh, there are any questions, you'll find me on Twitter, on on my website and stuff. Keep keep your, keep up to date on my blog. And uh, what I'm always happy for, um, I just got a great suggestion from somebody uh, as part of the questions for, for other topics to um, to look into AWS. I haven't done that so far, so it's always good to get suggestions from the community what they might find interest in. Sure. Yeah. And uh, and you know that's as I said before, that's what drives everything we do. Um, someone says, "Oh, I would love to hear Ian talk more about why he's still in the S." Are you crazy? Do I not talk enough already? <laughs> okay, well, uh, thanks everybody. Thanks for attending. Uh, um, we'll see you all next time. In fact, um, Jim will see you all next time. Jim got uh, a bit tied up with a few things today, which is why um, I did more talking than, than uh, most, uh, as usual. Um, Jim, are we done? It's probably disappeared. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I got tied up in other stuff. Apologies, but you guys are having a good conversation without me, so I figured I'd have that. <laughs> oh, poor Jim. I feel really mean now. <laughs> no, no, it's good. It's good. Okay. There's, uh, there's always, always more stuff that I want to do that I just don't have time to do. So it's good to have, uh, you know, support and other people that help out. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's what we're here for. That's why we're MVPs. You know, we're here to champion the product. We believe in the product. And, and uh, you know, our job is to, it's not our job, but, you know, it's our, our, our desire is to help uh, sort of discuss things. Anyway, well, thanks very much, everybody, for attending. And thank you for all the thank yous, as many of them as we go. Um, yeah. We'll see you all next time. And um, goodbye from Holger. Goodbye from me and Jim. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye, everybody.